And we had cashew nuts and raisins we would share with them. And even though in one sense there was a cultural boundary, in another sense we felt like family. And after a while we came to the snow line, which was 10,000 feet at that time of the year, and we found an abandoned shed there. And we decided to rest for a few days. And from the bottom of his backpack, my friend pulled out a blue paperback and gave it to me. And he said, you should read this. And that was Bhagavad Gita as it is by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So I sat there <laughs> surrounded by these snow-capped peaks, trying to understand this Bhagavad Gita as it is. And I found that I really did not understand it. At the same time, I had a strong sense that this book had knowledge that could give me values that would help <coughs> me become happy in this world. So it was a very unusual experience for me, sitting there with that book. Then we went back to India, and as fate would have it, we went to a town in India where the teachings of Bhagavad Gita are lived every day by the people we went to Vrindavan. This is 1971. It was a different Vrindavan than the Vrindavan we know today. And we spent a month in Vrindavan. And in that month I was transformed because where I had come from, the whole emphasis, the whole orientation was that you get a good education to get a good job. A good job meant you made a lot of money then you use that money for comforts and for some prestige and power. And in that way you lived your life. And people did that in the West, but I saw that very often their lives were not fulfilled. There was a certain emptiness and dissatisfaction in people. And here in Vrindavan I experienced that people were not so much interested in a high education or a good job or comforts or power and prestige. And yet they had a sense of fulfillment and completion in their lives that was palpable. And I felt was very much missing in the West. So I really had to stop and reevaluate my entire life. Vrindavan was a transforming experience for me. And in India, my friend and I had the great good fortune of meeting the author of Bhagavad Gita as it is, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. This picture was taken at Radha Temple in 1972 when Prabhupada was giving the um, talks on Nectar of Devotion and Srimad Bhagavatam, First Canto, Chapter 2. So, both my friend and I became students of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada and I spent the next 25 years studying his Bhagavad Gita as it is. And then I thought I'd really like to explain this book so that even a child could understand it. So I wrote and illustrated a Bhagavad Gita for children, our most dear friend. And by Krishna's grace it does well on Amazon from time to time. So these are some pages from this book. It begins as the Bhagavad Gita begins by explaining that we are not the material body. We're the soul that resides within the body. And it's the soul that gives the body life. Wherever we see life, we can know that this soul is present. Whether the body is that, is that of grass or a bug or a bird or trees or a person. If there's life, it means the soul was present. And Krishna explains that the body goes through all these changes, from birth to growth to old age and finally death, but the soul is not affected by all the changes of the body. Just as Krishna gives the analogy, when our clothes become old, we give them up and get a new set of clothes. So similarly, when the body is old and useless, the soul gives up that body 
and gets a new body. I paraphrase Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita. When you understand the soul, you will be joyful and will never forget your higher spiritual nature. Even if great, great trouble comes, you will not be disturbed. When you understand the soul, you will see that all living beings are part of me, the Supreme Spirit, God. You will see that they are my children and are spiritually equal. And you'll be kind to all living beings, knowing that they are all dear to me. So our personal story continues that my friend who initially invited me to come to India and who also became the student of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Prabhupada also married us. We are still married today. We have two daughters. The girl in the pink dress on the right is our elder daughter, Rasamrita. Krishna explains in the Gita that everything rests on him as pearls rest on a thread, that he knows past and present and future. Not a blade of grass moves without his will, and that he is also the most dear friend of all living entities. So when this project was finished, I thought I would like to do an illustrated Bhagavad Gita for adults, and that became Bhagavad Gita, a photographic essay. And by Krishna's grace, that was recognized by non-devotees when it came out. So this is my father-in-law. On the right, he was in his 20s. And on the left, he's in his 80s. So you can see the body changes completely, but it's the same person because the same soul is residing within that body. Krishna says that for those who are embodied, which is all of us, we must experience birth, old age and disease, and finally death. These things are inevitable for embodied souls. Also, it's explained that the soul is considered marginal energy, just as the beach is the margin between the land and the water. Sometimes the beach is covered with water, and sometimes the water recedes. So similarly, sometimes the soul is covered by Krishna's external energy, and at that time we think, oh, I am a man, or I am a woman, I'm Indian, I'm American, I'm this many years old. And sometimes, by the grace of Guru and God, that covering recedes. And at that time, we understand, I'm none of these designations. I'm a spiritual being. I'm part and parcel of God. Also, the soul is considered analogous to a bird and the body to a cage. So at the time of death, the soul leaves the body just as a bird flies out of a cage. Can you all still hear me? I don't know if I'm... It's okay? Yeah, okay. I guess we'd have no hope for a microphone this evening. Went through by the touch of Srila Prabhupada. And then I thought I'd really like to explore what happened to me because I had such a 180 degree turn in my life. So I began writing a memoir about that transformation that was inspired by Srila Prabhupada. And I wanted to go deep to try to exactly get what happened. My parents, I felt, were very good people, hard-working people, especially my father. He worked 12-hour days and was quite good at what he did. And yet, despite that, his business began to fail over the years. And so that was very painful for me to witness. So I left that world entirely. This is John and me on that mountaintop in Nepal. And in retrospect, at that time in my life, I was very confused and very empty and had no real direction. Even though I was surrounded by breathtaking beauty, I was actually a very lost person. 
And everything to me was very strange in that world in Nepal and India, but oddly enough, I was the strange one to the people there. But I found much in India that was really admirable. I appreciated the sentiment of service that I saw all around, how the elderly children served the younger children, how the parents served the children. In the West, I felt it was more a culture of getting, what can I get? And in India, it seemed to me to be more a culture of giving, and I appreciated that mood very much. And also in the West, you can live next door to somebody for decades and not know anything about them. But in India, that was not possible. Everybody knew everybody, for better or worse. It was a very much of a community spirit. And I appreciated that also. And although in the cities, this culture is now being westernized, it's being lost, still in the villages, it's very much present, the spirit of service and the spirit of community. John and I used to travel for days on the Indian trains, and we would take photographs from the trains. I also appreciated the agrarian life. It seemed very real to me. In the West, the work that people did didn't really have any solid value. And yet in India, there was very much value to the agrarian way of life, I felt. And I appreciated also the simplicity. I realized that you really don't need a lot to live happily. And very often the extra things that we acquire only make life more complicated and then more unhappy. But it was in Vrindavan, experiencing the incredible faith of the residents of Vrindavan, that really my heart was touched and transformed. It was in Vrindavan that I thought perhaps there's something beyond the senses, beyond the mind, beyond the intelligence. And perhaps that thing, whatever it was, was what was missing in my own life. So to be around people with such faith and so, so little uh, materially, I couldn't help but be moved to the very core of my being. Every day I would sit with widows who would chant the Maha Mantra for hours. And it seemed to me that they felt it was a privilege that very often in family life there's so many distractions for spirituality and they had given up those distractions so they could fo focus exclusively on the Holy Name and on Krishna. I had hear, heard the chanting in the West, but it was such a different circumstance and the people were so different that I didn't have the appreciation that I did in India. Although these widows spoke no English, just being in their presence was very moving. And it wasn't only the women, the men also were very absorbed in Krishna. The, the residents of Vrindavan. And all of this made sense to me because of Prabhupada's teachings and Prabhupada's personality. Otherwise I could not have understood the teachings of Krishna at all. But between Prabhupada's teachings and experiencing the faith, the incredible faith of the residents of Vrindavan, my life was transformed. And Prabhupada put us in touch with great Vaishnavas. This is his sister, Pishima, who used to visit us regularly in the temple in Calcutta. And Prabhupada personally took us around to the holy places. Here he's taking us to Vrindavan in 1972 on the bus. He also introduced us to Sridham Mayapur, the appearance place of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is Prabhupada in his rooms right here at Radha Damodar Temple. 
At this time, Jamuna, Devi, was cooking for him. She would make incredible meals. And one day she asked Prabhupada if it would be all right if I took a photograph of him while he was honoring Prashad. And he kindly agreed. So here he's looking out at the Samadhi and Bhajan Kutir of Srila Rupa Goswami. <coughs> so receiving Gayatri Mantra in Mayapur. Behind you can see again is Pishima, Prabhupada's sister. So Prabhupada taught that whatever propensity we have, almost anything that we like to do, we can do for Krishna. We can dovetail our propensities in Krishna's service. So my husband and I, of course, we like photography and cinematography, so we were able to use these things in Prabhupada's service. This is a picture from Vishakapatnam. Prabhupada would walk every day on the beach there. And in Juhu, I was photographing Prabhupada daily. And in the afternoon in Juhu, he would go to the rooftop and have darshan every afternoon. So one day I, I went there and I was, somehow I was a little bit early, so it was only Prabhupada and me on the rooftop. He was chanting Japa and I was sitting with my camera and he looked at me and he said, where should I look? <laughs> See, you all got it right away. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I had been photographing him for a few years and he never said that to me before and he never said it again. So it took me a few seconds to realize he was saying, where should I look for the photograph? And then I had to think of an answer. That became another... <laughs> My mind was racing, so finally I said, wherever you like, Srila Prabhupada. So he turned, and this is the picture that resulted from that. This is in Mayapur, Prabhupada's godbrother Sridhar Swami came to visit him. You see on the left, there are two elderly hands clapping. Those are the hands of Sridhar Swami, Srila Prabhupada's godbrother. Prabhupada was very happy to see him. When his car came to the Lotus Building, someone told Prabhupada, oh, Sridhar Swami was here, and Prabhupada immediately raced up, raced down the stairs and met Sridhar Swami as, as he was coming up the stairs. And they were very happy to see each other. They were laughing and speaking in Bengali, very jolly. They walked together to Prabhupada's rooms. They had a wonderful conversation about their early time together in Calcutta <coughs> and different places in India. And then they had a kirtan. This is that kirtan. And as we know, Prabhupada introduced these wonderful spiritual activities, prasadam distribution. We distributed prasadam to thousands of people in Mayapur daily by Prabhupada's instruction. And he introduced this glorious Rathiatra festival throughout the world. This is San Francisco. There's a story behind this picture. Do you all know the story behind this picture? No. no. I was photographing Prabhupada uh, regularly, as I was saying, and in San Francisco I started to go on the stage to photograph him, and some person, I don't know who it was, he said, no women are allowed on the stage to me as I was climbing the stairs. And I tried to argue that I was Prabhupada's photographer. I had been photographing him for years. My uh, camera was paid for by Prabhupada. My airline ticket was paid for by the BBT, by Prabhupada. But this person was adamant. There was no, there was no. Usually I would get around obstacles like this, but on this particular occasion I became depressed. And I was thinking here, the first teaching in Bhagavad Gita is that we're not this body. And here he is making this distinction based on the body, stopping me from my holy service to Srila Prabhupada. So I wandered out to the middle of the field in front of the stage. And I sat down in an empty chair there with my head down, thinking all these thoughts, the mind started going. And then all of a sudden the kirtan became louder. And I looked up and Prabhupada had gotten up from the Vyasasan, and he was throwing roses into the crowd. And then lo and behold, he started to dance. 
So I stood on the chair that I had been sitting on and I took a whole series of pictures. This is one of them. And it turned out that I could have not have been in a more perfect place for photographs. So there was a higher thing going on by Krishna's grace. But there were many obstacles, uh, being a woman in Prabhupada's service, because as you can see, he's surrounded by male devotees. I'm on the far left there. And Prabhupada himself faced many problems. People would write to him throughout the world with their personal problems, the problems they were having with other devotees, the problems they were having perhaps in the city that they were living in, with the authorities, the police, and so on. And Prabhupada would respond to all those and give guidance and inspiration and encouragement. And yet all those problems came to him every day. He had some extraordinary students. One of them was Yamuna Devi. We hear her singing every morning when we greet the deities. She was also an incredible cook. Her cookbook won the best cookbook of the year and it was the first vegetarian cookbook to do so. George Harrison at one point told her that he could make her internationally famous because of the quality of her voice and her response was that she had no interest in that, she simply wanted to go on with her service to Srila Prabhupada. This is from her cookbook, Milk and Milk Products. So in 1977, Prabhupada became very ill and returned here to Vrindavan. The residents of Vrindavan were extremely concerned, as were Prabhupada's students. His health was failing. And yet, as we know, his mind remained clear to the last moments. So that was my personal journey as Prabhupada's aspiring devotee. This is on the rooftop of the temple in New York City, 55th Street in Manhattan. Now this became five years, 11 months, and a lifetime of unexpected love. The non-devotees have received it well by Krishna's grace. And more recently, my husband and I have just released a film, a 90-minute feature film about Srila Prabhupada, his life and his teachings. It uh, recently played throughout the United States in about 65 theaters. And uh, on November 12th, it will have its premiere in India at the Syria Fort Auditorium. And then we're looking now for a distributor to bring it throughout India. It's also having a premiere tonight, is it? Tonight. Sorry? Just finished. Uh, the premiere in Aus Australia just finished. So gradually we're trying to get it throughout the world. It played in also in Moscow um, on Prabhupada's appearance day. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> we have a few minutes left. I hope there's some points for discussion. Fifteen minutes or so. If there's some points anyone would like to discuss, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Do you know you wanted to be? Do you know you wanted to be a Shastra Prabhu? Yeah. 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 Ye
In other words, to show the people in the West how people in India live without electricity, without the modern amenities, machinery, and so forth. They lived in a very traditional way. So we thought this was a brilliant idea. And uh, the one problem we, we had was we didn't know what village would be suitable for that article. So we thought, well, Srila Prabhupada has traveled throughout India. We should ask him what village to go to to do this project. So we told him our brilliant idea, and he looked at us with a mixture of amusement and um, gravity. And he said, you do not speak the language. Wherever you go, they will simply cheat you and steal your cameras. <laughs> he was very practical. Prabhupada was a very practical person. <laughs> so we were quite deflated by that. And he paused a moment, and then he said, best that you go to Vrindavan and you do your story there. So that's how, after Nepal, we wound up in Vrindavan. And that was my first instruction from Srila Prabhupada, and it was the perfect instruction for me, because in Vrindavan, I was in this environment that was just saturated with faith, and that's what I had none of. So by being in Vrindavan, I somehow absorbed a tiny bit of that. Thank you. The question is that how did we find my husband and I? How did we finance ourselves? Because the camera is so expensive, the film is so expensive, and uh, we were not working. So we both came with cameras to Prabhupada's service, and then at that time we didn't have expenses because we ate at the temple, we lived at the temple, so all the uh, that cost was covered. So whatever little money we had, we put into film, <laughs> to buying film and developing film. And we were trying to be very careful. Every picture counts. So in that way, we somehow or other made, made do. <laughs> how, how can you see from that? You can't see the screen. <laughs> see from there. Oh. <laughs> uh, can you give us some experience of the bombing? We spent, uh, Malati Prabhu also is here, we spent many, many years in Juhu. Uh, you know, at the beginning it was uh, a jungle in the front and then some tenant buildings in the back. The front was used as a local garbage dump when we first came. And we had temporary structures for Radharasa Bihari for many, many years. And to get to Mumbai, or what was then called Bombay from Juhu, was very austere, packed up in the trains with no room to even breathe. But Prabhupada saw tremendous potential in Juhu from the very first time he saw it, and he never lost that vision. His followers did lose that vision from time to time, but Prabhupada never lost it. And so because of his perseverance and his vision, he kind of dragged all the rest of us. And uh, yeah, he had this tremendous experience with Mr. Nair there, the famous uh, conflict that went on for years. So, there, I mean, there were so many amazing stories from Juhu. Do you have anything specific that you're thinking of? Or? I want to know what the morning box in the Juhu. The mor morning box. Morning walks. Oh, the morning walks, yeah. That was very wonderful. Juhu is only two or three minute walk to the beach. And uh, there would just be a small group of people w that went with Prabhupada daily, like maybe half a dozen. And Prabhupada would stride down the beach. The sand was perfect for walking, not too soft, not too hard. 
they would walk a long way and uh, discuss so many things and very often this Dr. Patel would come with his friends and then it would get very animated because Dr. Patel, although he thought he was a Vaishnava, in fact he was an impersonalist and Prabhupada would repeatedly point out his impersonal understanding and there would be arguments, sometimes heated arguments and the devotees who were with Prabhupada would become angry because Dr. Patel did not have the reverential attitude towards Prabhupada that we felt he should have and he would get fiery and Prabhupada would get fiery in return I remember once I was watching Satsrut Maharaj who was on the walk he was holding his danda and he was so angry that his knuckles were becoming white holding his danda hearing the perhaps lack of respect on the part of Dr. Patel and uh, it was it was quite amazing the, the conversation would go all different ways and to hear Prabhupada's the, com the thoroughness of his understanding and how he would never give up trying to give Dr. Patel this knowledge but at some point Prabhupada saw that his followers were so disturbed by this that he made the very unusual decision to read Krishna book as we walked so one devotee would be having the book would walk along fortunately there was nothing to trip on or anything <laughs> and uh, when Dr. Patel saw that there was no room now for discussion he wouldn't walk with us, he would walk separately with his friends but sometimes he would meet with Prabhupada in the afternoon in his room and some years later he wrote an article for Back to Godhead, this Dr. Patel and the article was called The Most Precious Moments of My Life about those morning walks so eventually he became appreciative. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I assume you were making photos for Prabhupada for while he was giving classes and uh, during during RT. Um, was it okay for him? Wasn't he distracted? Or what was his opinion when he was picturing him during? some devotion service uh, Prabhupada was okay with taking pictures every time except during his classes during his classes he wanted everyone to sit and pay attention and so he would object if there were pho photography going on during the class but during RT and during darshan times and morning walks he had no objection at all but he really wanted us to sit and hear during class. That was very important to him. And that continues to this day. That we are supposed to engage our bodies in Krishna's service and also our mind and intelligence. And so the mind and intelligence comes in during the class. So we're expected to sit and apply ourselves to try to understand the philosophy. And of course the responsibility is also on the speaker to engage our mind and intelligence but it's both sides, the audience and the speaker both need to be present. <coughs> Thank you. Were you using flashlights? I, I had a, what they call dedicated strobe. That's when you, you have a, a, strobe on your, a, a strobe on your camera and it lights up other strobes in the room. The question is, when did I surrender to Srila Prabhupada? So I was initiated in 1971, November. At that moment, I made the plunge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Um, can you speak a little bit as to why women um, do not have disciples and what role they play in the succession, the descendant succession? 
Everyone heard the question? <laughs> the question is why women do, do not have disciples and what role they play in disciplic succession. So we find uh, Bhaktivinod Thakur in his songs, he gives all reverence to Janavamata, and in fact Janavamata is a woman who had disciples, so it is part of our line. When Prabhupada was in Toronto, he was with several professors, and one of them, Professor O'Connell, asked him if women can accept disciples, and Prabhupada said yes, he gave the example of Janavamata, and then he made some very interesting statements along those lines. He said that in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that women, Vaishya Sudras, they can all go to the highest destination. That's in chapter 9. And he said, if, if the woman can go to the highest destination, where is the question that she cannot take disciples? If someone is going back to Godhead, you're going to say that person cannot take disciples? Queen Kunti could not take disciples. And he also said just to this professor, just like in your college, if someone comes and they're qualified to be a professor, man or woman, it doesn't matter, they become professor. So similarly, if someone is qualified to become guru, their gender does not matter. He said, but it's rare that women become. It's rare, but if they're qualified, they can become. It was a very short answer, just a paragraph, but he made three very profound, incontrovertible, incontrovertible points. Is that okay? Hare <coughs> Krishna, thank you so much. Uh, just back to piggyback on that question, since Prabhupada said, yes, uh, women can become guru, how come after 50 years we haven't seen a female guru? Please ask our local GBC here. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that the reason it's not happening is because my esteemed colleagues on the GBC table, 50% of them have a problem. <laughs> Yes, it's a fact. And every time we brought it to a vote, and you have to have a quorum, you know, a certain majority when you make some kind of resolution or you pass something. And time after time, it gets just right down the center. So they've come to the realization that they can't get around it because Srila Prabhupada has acknowledged it, even in letters. I want that all my spiritual sons and daughters will become spiritual masters, etc. But somehow, somehow, they're having a problem digesting that. <laughs> so my humble request to all of you is write to your nearest and dearest GBC member <laughs> and encourage that person. Some of them are already on board, but encourage that person to, um, you know, you said take the plunge, take the plunge. I mean, there's a lot that could be said. I mean, for the last how many years that the men have been representing Shiva Prabhupada? Ladies are also representing, but not in that capacity. And um, I can't, you know, honestly, as, as a lady, okay, you can say I'm biased, but I really can't see what harm would become of it. John Lennon said, give peace a chance. We're saying, give the ladies a chance. <laughs> and I'd also like to say that if you don't have the book authored by Rishabha Devi Dasi that um, she highlighted at the end, you have copies here tonight, don't you? That please take advantage and support. Not only, you know, did Prabhupada encourage ladies in all aspects of devotional service. But he also encouraged ladies to write. But not so many have done that. So here is one rare example and a very accomplished example. And this book that she has written has won the hearts, male and female, of the disciples of Srila Prabhupada and his followers. 
So please take advantage. Get one tonight. Some of the people say that if we have women become gurus, that the people in India would be um, disrespectful of our movement and wouldn't think it was bona fide. But is there any real evidence to that? I know there, there are many of them, like the Ama, the Hugging Guru, she's Indian. That's why I'm asking the question, is there any really it's such called, evidence? Like, let's ask the women in this room, if there are women gurus, will that disturb you? Yeah. Oh, no, no. no. So, okay, so it's not, it's not really, it's not based on a, on a particular fact, right? What's the, what does the Google say? Yeah, I, I, what does the Google say? No substance to that argument. People can argue about anything, but if you're going to be effective, then you have to use some clear logic and beyond logic some facts. Just like, you know, when I was elected to the GDC, there was all kinds of dire predictions that was going to happen. But so far, not one of them happened. It's just a theory. It's like if I say 80% of people think this, but there's no facts to back. Anyway, it, a lot of it comes down to an identity crisis of those on that side. And the unfortunate thing is they're identifying with the body and not the soul. Even after understanding so many instructions on that matter. <laughs> Uh, the same question, um, we can look at that when Prabhupada was a visionary and he uh, did a lot of things that were not, um, you would consider they weren't done in India, like um, having women initiated, having them live in ashrams. And also when the devotees first came here, um, the, the general population, you know, especially the Brahmins, were yeah, considering that the devotees were malechas, they were this and that. But Prabhupada still, you know, initiated and pushed the movement forward despite that. So this is another example of you know, just being a visionary and you know, giving women opportunity despite you know, 